Thank you, Jerry, for leading us in a, a, a wonderful experience as we appreciate our country. And I also want to thank the appraised band for all that they do. Many of you don't realize the amount of work that they put in each week getting ready for this service. So, uh, I certainly appreciate all of their efforts and we're richly blessed to have them as a part of our worship experiences here at Mary First Church. Today is quite a, an eventful day because it is a day not only that we celebrate Holy Communion, it's the first Sunday of the month, it's the first United Methodist Church, but it's also Independence Day weekend, a time of family and visits and cookouts, and it's a time to celebrate our freedom, to understand where we came from, and to hopefully get a better picture of where we might be going. Our scripture lesson this morning is found in Matthew, the 11th chapter, beginning at verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all of you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we do ask your blessing to be with us this day. Bless this word that we have read that, Lord, it might be anointed to speak to our hearts. Help us to set aside the burdens that we carry and come to you once more, seeking your grace, your love, and your presence. Amen. They tell the story of an older lady who had lived her life and wanted to event to finally take a trip overseas. And as you well know, she had to get a passport. So she went down several months before she planned to leave on her trip and applied for her passport, put down the fee that needed to be paid. And the clerk said, now before we can send this off, you have to take an oath of allegiance. Please raise your hand and repeat after me. I solemnly swear that I will uphold the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. To which the little lady replied, all by myself? Did you ever feel like you were in this all by yourself? Did you ever feel like that no one else understood you and that everyone else was seemingly going a different direction from where you were going? And you tried to make sense of all that was happening, and sometimes we do get so confused and we try to figure out just who are we and where are we, especially on a holiday like this, Independence Day, the 4th of July, celebrating the birth of our nation and what that represents to who we are. Do we understand what that truly means? Do we fully comprehend what we as Americans are? There is a famous statue in New York Harbor, and inscribed on that statue are these words. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. We've sort of forgotten that right now, haven't we? We've forgotten who we are. We have forgotten where we came from. The Statue of Liberty proclaims a freedom for all of humanity, for all of creation to come, the homeless, the poor, the wretched, the tempest-tossed, all of you come and we'll find a place for you. That's what America was about. 
And a part of our problem is that the farther we get away from the event that created us and formed us, many times the more we forget what actually took place. It isn't long before we rewrite history. We make it more comfortable for us. And we fail to understand the sacrifices that were made so that we might all experience that true freedom. And so on this Communion Sunday, I would remind all of us to remember where we came from. Now, how many of you have ever done a, a, a genealogy search, a search? You know, you've tried to look back into your ancestry. I went through that stage where I did that, and I wanted to find out where I came from. And I just knew that it had to be royalty after all. I mean, there just couldn't help but be royalty in my bloodline somewhere. And if I could just find the right link, I could be able to go back to the home country and stake my claim on some castle somewhere, and I would set up my empire and live off the inheritance of old money, old money. Well, the more I searched, the more discouraged I became. Because I realized, like the vast majority of us, we did not come from nobility. We came from the wretched masses yearning to be free. We came from the homeless that were seeking a better place and a better opportunity. We came from those people who did not have any future in the homeland, and they struck out in order to find a better place, a new place, they realized that that was no longer their lot. In fact, if we're quite honest with us, with who we are and where we came from, yes, except for the Native Americans, we all came from, from, uh, from foreign shores, and we came sometimes under the most questionable of circumstances when they emptied the prisons and they got rid of all the riffraff well, that's who we are. But we came with a sense of purpose, and we came with the idea that we could allow others to come as well and experience that same freedom. But unfortunately, we seem to be forgetting that. It's amazing that as a country, we just can't have a legitimate immigration policy. I mean, what is so hard about that? But we politicize it. And we draw straw or draw sides and we get into to combat with each other. And we shouldn't be. Because we need to remember where we came from. We need to remember where we came from spiritually. We haven't always been saints, have we? We haven't always been righteous, have we? We haven't always done the right thing, have we? No, we haven't. For in all of our lives, we have all been sinners. We've all experienced our, our downtime, our ways in which we rebelled against God, our ways in which we said no to Christ and his grace. We've all had those experiences of rebellion. And yet somehow, somewhere, someplace, God's grace came into our hearts and our lives and touched us and brought us into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to remember where we came from, not only as a people, but where we came from spiritually, that yes, we were all sinners, we were all in need of God's grace. And I don't know about you, but I'm still there. I still need that grace. I still need God's presence because I have not arrived. I have not fully attained all that God wants to give to me. So we need to remember where we came from. Next, we need to remember why we're here. Now, yesterday was a wonderful day for the parade. People were celebrating and waving flags, and there were all kinds of activities going on. And probably the number one word that you would have heard yesterday and throughout this entire weekend is freedom. We as an Americans are celebrating our freedom. We are a free nation. And we want to celebrate that freedom, not only with ourselves, but with others. And we want everyone to appreciate our freedom. But now there's a price for that freedom. 
and we'll get to that later. And sometimes it bothers us, doesn't it, when we see people who want the freedom but they never are willing to pay the price? People who want to take advantage of an opportunity or an advantage of someone else, and they do so in the name of, it's my right, it's my freedom, it's my choice, but they've never paid the price. What word would we say in the church? What would be the word that we United Methodists would use that would be just as comparable to that word of freedom? Well, I think it has to be grace. We believe in God's unabounded grace to each and every one of us, that God's grace is there. And that grace is available. In fact, Paul said in Romans that that grace that was given to us, that we could not use it as an excuse to continue in sin. In other words, the grace came with a price. Someone paid a price for the grace that we experience. And because of that, we can't just say, oh, I'll do what I want to. I'll live the way I want to live. I'll experience anything I want to do. And right at the last moment, I'll just plead the grace of God, and I'll be fine. Well, such a view is so elementary and simplistic to what it means to be a true Christian. Because God doesn't want us to play games God wants us to be followers. He wants us to be a part of the family, to be a part of his church. And so just as we proclaim freedom and just as we proclaim grace, we realize that there is a price that has to be paid. And some of that price is the diligence in which which we use to, to understand what God is doing in our hearts and our lives, the sacrifices that we make. Oh, yes, it's easy just to to come and to go and to criticize and to leave and to, you know, but that's not what it means to be a part of the church. To be a part of the church means that we are involved. We're working together. And when we work together, we realize that God is using so many different people in so many different ways. They tell the story of a young African-American boy growing up in the early uh, in the mid-1900s, and as he was growing up, he kept getting in trouble at school. And so they decided that uh, they needed to to try to give him some attention and that they would would help him try to understand that he needed to be responsible. And so they started making him memorize the Constitution. You all know what the Constitution is, don't you? You have it memorized, I assume? Sort of right behind the Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes and the... (laughs) all those other things, you know. So they started asking him to memorize parts of the, of the Constitution. Well, he was a boy that was in trouble a lot. <laughs> and so he was in trouble so much that he memorized the entire Constitution. That young boy's name was Thurgood Marshall, the first African-American justice of the Supreme Court. The price that we pay, the efforts that we put forth can make a tremendous difference in who we are and in the freedoms that we experience and in the grace that we show. Then we also need to remember the price that was paid by others. As Christian people, we must never forget that Jesus died, that he sacrificed himself for us. As a nation, we must never forget that there are countless men and women who have sacrificed their lives for our freedom. They have given the ultimate price and they have made that sacrifice so that we can sit here today and worship God out of choice. But many times we, we don't pay that price. We're not willing to do that. We want, we, want, we want it easy. Now, in this passage of Scripture, Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden and burdened, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Now, last week, if you were paying attention, I was talking about rewards. 
and I was talking about how God would reward us if we were willing to make the hard choices in life. And sometimes those hard choices would mean that even father and son would not disagree and that there would be a division between the family. Mother and daughter, would, there would be a division. In other words, to be a real Christian, you're going to have to stand up and be your own person. You're not going to have it easy. It's not going to be your way. It's not going to be the family unit. You're going to have to be your own individual. Now, this week, we're talking about the yoke is easy and the burden is light. Hard, easy. Which one is it? Well, what seems to be a contradiction really isn't. For scholars say that when it talks about the yoke being easy, it's not saying that it's something that's frivolous and light, but it's saying something else. For you see, there is a legend that Jesus, during his young adult years, spent his time in Nazareth working in his father's carpentry shop. And as he was there, one of the main tasks that he had to do was to fit yokes on teams of oxen. And the carpenter would be the person who would design and fit the yoke. Now, you just don't go to the shelf, the yoke shelf, and pull off a yoke and put it on a team of oxen because they may not fit. And it's like wearing a pair of shoes that don't fit or something else that's rubbing you raw. You, you, just don't, you just can't work that way. And so Jesus, the legend goes, would spend a significant amount of time making certain that the yoke fit properly for the team of oxen that was going to be put together and teamed together. Scholars believe that when it says that the yoke is easy and the burden is light, what it really says to us is the yoke is well fitted for you. Have you ever tried to be something that you're not? Have you ever tried to be a super Christian and you're not? Have you ever tried to have a religious experience that's just not yours? What God is trying to say to us is that I want to be with you, yoke with you, and I want it to be such a well-fitting match that you're going to work the hardest that you've ever worked in your life, and you're going to enjoy every moment of it because it's going to be productive. It's going to be getting you somewhere. And isn't that true about life? You can go to work 40 hours a week and hate every moment of it and dread going to work. And a significant number of our population is in that condition. But there are a few people who actually love to go to work. They enjoy the company. They enjoy the work. They enjoy what they're doing. What Jesus is saying to us is, when you become yoked with me, it's not a burden. It's not a task. When you're properly yoked with me, the work will be accomplished. And it will all be done to the glory of God. Today we come to take communion. I can remember thinking, oh man, communion on, on Independence Day weekend. What a bummer. That's really going to hurt attendance. And then I realized that this communion service is really the same significance as a fireworks display. It's how we celebrate who we are. It's a recognition of our past. It's an understanding of the, the price that was paid and the commitment that we make. I hope and pray that all of us will be the best Americans that we can be, that we will be the best citizens that we can be. But I also hope and pray that we will be the best Christians we can be when we are properly yoked with Christ. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.